This episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors, Galaxy Finance. Sponsors and personal friends that I trust, that I trust enough to go to with questions about my own finances. That's not a sales pitch, that's fact. Any questions, any queries, they have the solutions from home loan lending to complete financial planning. With official interest rates at an all-time low, the lenders want your business. With Galaxy Finance, they'll do all the work for you and find the best possible deal. They'll do it all. Get in contact, ask for Leanne, and mention Unfiltered for a free chat. A free chat. No obligations. A free chat just by mentioning Unfiltered. Galaxyfinance.com.au is where you can find them. The great ones, they're different. They really are. Not better, just different. Sure, there's a physical power, a mental strength, a complex but resolute constitution too. There's a whole lot more than just the measurables. That's something else, that intangible. It separates us from them. Welcome to the Legends series on Andy Raymond Unfiltered. Headlines? There's been a few, probably as many off the field as on it. With boots on, graceful, athletic, a winner, his resume is all time. There's another side to this guy too, a side that has changed dramatically and positively. I'll let him tell you. But who is Darius Boyd? It's a hard question. Um, I've changed a lot over the years, I know that. Um, Learned a lot about myself. Um... Worked on myself a lot, which I'm you know, very proud of, and I like to think now I'm probably just you know pretty carefree, easygoing guy. Loves family, loves his daughters, his wife, and not much else happens for me. You know, I love helping people, do a lot of mental health space. It's um, something I'm passionate about. I enjoyed my time in rugby league, and now I'm excited to see what other things I can do in the world and life. Describe me, a young Darius. What were you like as a kid? Oh, my young, young years. I was you know pretty happy. I think easy going kid, yeah. and then somewhere along the lines, I got you know quite introverted and yep. um, a bit um, sour on the world, and it felt like I was a bit hard done by in a few mm. different reasons. And um, but yeah, I, I'm glad I finally found myself again, I guess. And and, and like I said before, worked on myself and um, got back to that happy kid, I guess. You've spoken about living with your mum, your grandmother throughout your childhood, as well as friends, families. As we sit here in 2021, can you look back and see how you've built a certain level of resilience that perhaps may have formed way back then? Yeah, I talk about my past a lot, I suppose, the things I do with the mental health space. And on one hand, my childhood was, you know, challenging and um, led me to have some obstacles later in life, but at the same time... Uh, I think I did build a lot of resilience and now that I've learned a bit about you know, tips and tools and strategies of you know, core mental health and you know, what breeds resilience, I guess, I think um, that you know, early on a bit of adversity really helped me for later in life and, and now for my family and, and having you know, children of my, my own that I can uh, talk to my eldest on the way home from school and ask, of, you know, tell me three things you're grateful for each and every day. So uh, I'm trying to... Instill some resilience at her in an early yeah. age, albeit in a different way that I learned it. But um, yeah, I think it's something that I'm, um, in a way, I can be positive about and grateful for. And your life's busy, married happily, three young daughters. Yeah, well, um, every time I tell people I've got three kids, and then I, I say girls, they all start to seem to laugh. And they, <laughs> um, but yeah, end of the day, I mean, you know, it's something that they're, yeah, they're happy and healthy. That's mm. all you can ask for. And um, there's always you know challenges at, at any different ages. And um, yeah, but it's all. You know, part of life and growth and you know i'm looking forward to just you know seeing them grow and and seeing them um you know, become young adults and what personalities they all have and and eventually hopefully them looking after me one day a relatively unknown fact you repeated year 12 not because you needed to scholastically but because you didn't have a direct pathway into the nrl that was your goal that was your focus it paid off you made the aussie school side you repeated year and the Broncos came knocking, right? Yeah, it was um, it was something I've said a few times, but um, probably doesn't sound you know good for my academics. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was something that a lot of kids back then were doing three year seniors, and yep. um, I didn't, I suppose, 
know that people could do that or that was a part of you know something you could choose and come to year 12 i didn't have anything you know rugby league wise and you know you said that was you know my massive dream and mm. Uh, probably put a lot of eggs into one basket and lucky it paid off but yeah that that was the best decision for me personally in the end it, you know i need another 12 months to grow and probably grow into my body and feel more confident and um you know, i made the australian schoolboys team which i haven't really i never made queensland before that that year um uh-huh. so i even made my local rep, rep sides all growing through the, the juniors and uh, the broncos gave me um yeah a scholarship and a one-year contract to go up there the following year and Rest is history, I guess. Best decision I definitely made for my rugby league career. Who approached you from the Broncos? What was the sales pitch? Um, well, I think it really it was Cyril, like Cyril Connell. Yep. Um, but I think uh, and Ivan Henjak was accompanying him at the time. Uh, Cyril was getting older, obviously. Yeah. But um, I think Rod, Ron Patterson, my um, school coach at the time, who I still keep in contact with, and he's a bit of a it was just huge help for me in my early yep. early years, and a bit of that you know Wayne mentor role model type as well. Um, you know, I think he kind of push them into my direction as well mm. uh, I think they had a scholarship left and they're like looking at who they should give it to and I think he tossed my name up and um, like I said yeah it was probably just something I needed to grow into my body physically mm. and I need another 12 months you know there's kids at you know, 15 and younger that have you know bulldogs and dragons contracts scholarships yep. and I didn't, really didn't get noticed so um, yeah it was something that I think it was a mutual decision from both the school and the, and the Broncos. Walking into a first grade setup, comfortable, uncomfortable, intimidating, relaxed? Oh, it was definitely challenging. It's, um, I mean, my first experience into the club was a uh, six-day army camp. So oh. I went to schoolies for a day or two and then caught the train up to Brisbane, uh, staying at the Broncos' house. I think I unpacked my bags and we were told, uh, as the whole squad was told, that as a... Um, Camp up the Sunshine Coast, you know, bring your, your boardies and your surfboards and everything else. And we got to the Broncos uh, Red Hill facility and there was 30 army bags lined up, one to 30, numbered, you know, camouflage. You had to put your, your, your kit on with all the numbers as well. You couldn't call anyone by names, you're all by number. And this is unbeaten, you know, um, I don't think Lockie did it, but most other older guys did it. Yeah. We Webke, you know, Corey Parker, Sean Berrigan, you know, all these type of guys. I'm meeting them for the first time um, in this wow. army style environment. Um, but again, I think, you know, end of the day of rugby league was my goal. It was something that I'd probably gone through harder things and adversity mm. through my childhood in different ways. So, you know, a little army camp, um, to you know, season myself into NRL was probably, uh, something I was managed to get through. You mentioned Shane Webke. It seems every young Bronco has a Shane Webke story. He was very much the benchmark of the Broncos. He was the standard bearer. He was very hard on the young blokes. Mm. What was your Shane Webke initiation? Um, a couple, I think. One, yeah, his training, his work ethic. I remember we, uh, we did an amazing race around Brisbane one year and we had to do some you know, crazy things like scull a litre of custard before you could move on to the next oh. stage and then you had to run up, up and down all the flights of stair, uh, levels at Suncorp. Then we had to you know, catch cabs and with no money, um, all to get back to, uh, I think, Red Hill, the, the training facility. Yeah. Uh, and I remember, maybe there's custard, I don't know, but halfway through that run and that experience, I was um, you know, out the back and he was still up the front leading the way and charging. He's probably had 20 or 30 kilos on me as well. So, um, But yeah, it was something that I suppose they had a level of a standard and a respect yeah. and you had to you know, earn your respect and earn the trust of the group, um, which... Now, I didn't, I was, you know, like I said, an introverted kid and I probably said hi and bye to him and Darren Lockyer and those type of blokes for, for 12 months and uh, probably didn't really, really feel comfortable until probably second and third year. I see a lot of Darren Lockyer in you or you in Darren Lockyer. I haven't worked out which way it is. Were you too close? Did you model yourself on him in any way or off the field? Oh, I think our personalities were probably similar. Mm. You know, um, he's someone that obviously worked very hard at, at his craft and what he did and um you know, when he was the captain and the leader he was always you know action and not so much words yep. you know or he'd give you a, an evil look and you knew you knew you let him down uh, which i'd probably did a few times when i was younger um but more so in later years um you know, i've probably become you know, more confident and able to speak to some of the older guys and as we played origin and you know, rep teams yep. together probably felt more comfortable talking to you know someone of darren Lockie's um ilk i guess and um and then I suppose when I become the captain, I thought, you know, the captain I would be would be more of a, you know, I felt comfortable talking in front of the mm. group, but I wanted to be a leader and lead by example. And I thought, you know, that's kind of what Lockie did and that was kind of suited my you know, game and personality as well. You're listening to Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Legends series. 
We have corporate and private sponsorship packages available. You set the terms. For further information on how you can become part of the team, go to the website andyraymondunfiltered.com.au and hit the sponsorship tab. Sunday the 12th of March 2006, Suncorp Stadium versus the North Queensland Cowboys. 46,229 fans, debut day. Mm. Sadly, you copped an absolute thumping, but you scored a try on debut. What stands out from not only the day, but the week leading in? It was a couple of things. Um, I got to play myself and Steve Michaels were on the wings that game, and he was a, a a guy from the Gold Coast. We yep. went to school together and we played oh, wow. with and against each other since we were probably seven or eight years old. That's cool. uh, he played the year before, he debuted the year before, and uh, we ended up moving in together. So that was pretty cool. I think we got a photo. I've got it somewhere still uh, of me and him back to back with our Broncos jerseys on. Um, so that, that, was, that was something I always remember. Obviously scoring a try. And we, yeah. It was the only try we scored. And I think Matt Bowen and JT had a field day. But you know, for me to score a try in front of that pack stadium in my first game, I was you know, pretty happy with that. And, and the last thing was that um, I thought was pretty special was that uh, they got Broncos organized for my grandmother to come up. Uh, I think they picked up picked her up in a limousine from her house, drove her up to the game, nice. sat her in a box. Uh, I think she might have even sat next to Trish Bennett, Wayne's wife, mm. um, which I, th- I think she, you know, always remembered and always appreciated. And, and for me, you know, I was very, very, you know, humble with that as well. So I think it was a couple of things that I remember and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Yeah, Grandma's been the one, hasn't she, for you? Yeah, well, she's. In a time of need, uh, she you know, took me in and it wasn't easy. You know, she, yeah. didn't, she didn't drive a lot and I had to catch the buses and trains and you know, trying to still get to football training and rely on lifts and asking, uh, she was probably in her mid-70s to you know, start packing lunches again for yeah. school and different things. Yeah, it was a challenge, but um, yeah, like I said, took me in at a time of need and you know, we become really, really close in um, her last probably 10 years of, of life. From schoolboy to superstar in six months, literally, what life adjustments were needed? What changed about you or with you? Yeah, well, firstly, I wouldn't say superstar, um, but I you're suppose, underplaying that, mate. Yeah, um, I suppose um, the hardest part, I guess, was just the you know, media and the attention. Yep. And you know, I was, like I said, an introverted kid, still a quiet guy. Um, I just wanted to play one game for the Broncos. That was my dream and passion. And and then to suppose see how it all. You know, what everything that comes with it, and there's some great things that come with rugby league, mm. and then there's some uh, not so yeah. enjoyable moments too. And um, like I said, I didn't have you know some role models and father figures around, so mm. I didn't really have anyone in, you know in my corner like really day in day out. You know, Wayne was there and he was great, and I learned on him a lot, and I learned a lot from Wayne. Um, but you know, he wasn't you know my father. He wasn't a, a role model, someone mm. that I could you know rely on day in day out and really get that you know kick up the backside if I needed or some really core cool advice in, in crucial times. So I think I struggled with, you know, a lot of that in the early years. I was making it up as I went for myself personally. Yep. And as, you know, times and different experiences come around, I'd just have to deal with it the way I knew best and probably wasn't the best way, mm. but I was making it up. And so, But it was, yeah, some good times as well. We were pretty successful in those early years, so they probably masked a lot of the challenges I had. And it probably wasn't until I, you know, had some... Failures in rugby league, in particular, that I probably felt that I could see, you know, some cracks starting to appear in you know, my personality and my and my health. I guess. Did you change as a bloke? Do you have to change as a bloke, going from complete anonymity to being recognised everywhere and being a a public figure? Yeah, well, for a long period of time, I really had um, a strange outlook on the way. You know, if people would, you know just look at you in the street or a coffee yeah. shop or whatever, I didn't. I used to think. You know, what are they looking at? Why are they staring at me? I used to think negatively instead of yep. thinking they could be thinking positively. They could have just brushed past eyes. You don't even, they didn't even recognize you. You don't even know yeah. anything. But I always had that, you know, for different reasons, probably that negative outlook on certain situations. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, no, I just, and I'm probably still the same now. I mean, I'm someone that, you know, probably slipped into, you know, back into the real world and um, my rugby league was a past life and it was something yeah. that you don't really focus on too much but um so i was probably just a quiet guy that was happy to live a simple life and yep. then it's probably out of your control a little bit and i for a long period of time i think i try to hide myself away or i didn't want people to know about me or about my family or you know i didn't want to do a lot of media interviews and different things and in the end it become you know 
too draining and taxing. I just had to you know, kind of be open, honest. I had to change my you know, thought process, my mentality mm. on a lot of things. And I'm glad I did do that because you know I was able to grow. Rugby league was, you know, in one aspect, has been great that you're forced into situations, you know, with sponsors and and you know big environments with different people where you have to, you know, have to talk and open up and yep. and, and and grow and put yourself in in uh, situations you're probably not as comfortable being in. But um, I've got to be grateful for that to you know, give you open your eyes to a big world out there, and it's a lot bigger than just the rugby league community. Obvious next question, a first grade footballer is so much more than being an elite athlete for 80 minutes a week. The spotlight, the fans, the media, the sponsorship, the recognition, both positive and negative. Mm. It's more than 80 minutes of footy. Yeah, and I think the sooner you understand that and learn that, the better. You know, I think that when you understand it's, um, I, mean, I wanted to just play rugby league, I didn't understand or want any of the yep. things you just said, but... That's part of it. It comes with it. It's how the game grows. Is why the fans are the fans. Why we have you know, so much money invested into the game, and um, why we all love it so much. So it's it's a part of it, and you've got to you know, do your part. Is almost these days it's probably bigger outside the eighty minutes than it is in the eighty. Yeah. If when you really think about it, um, so it's yeah, it's a part of it. It's something that um, again, it probably took me ten years in my career to really mm. understand and really come to terms with, and and I suppose do my part outside the 80 minutes i probably didn't do my part for a long time um but yeah it's it's part of it it's something that as soon as you can understand that and, and make sure you're willing to you know take it all on board then the better you'll be the spotlight on a young nrl player the pressure on a young nrl player i actually think it's getting worse and i use nathan cleary um, and sam walker as examples mm -hmm. two kids mm who are just expected to play at 9 out of 10 every week, which is an unachievable, unrealistic expectation. Yeah. Yeah, I think social media has a big part in that to play, you know, with uh, the access that, you know, everyone can get to you now. Yeah. Usually when I, when I started, if you had a bad game, you'd probably read about it in the paper on Saturday mm. or Sunday, and then you know, Monday's a new, new week. Mm. Uh, but now with, you know, Fox League and 24-7 talk shows, you need content to fill. Um, you know, like I said, social media, everyone has a, a chance to um, have their opinion and voice, good and bad. I'm um, not bagging either, but there's you know, pros and cons to both. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like you said, yeah, well, these kids, you know, and, and, and those in those positions in particular, if you're in the halves, you know, it's hard to find good halfbacks and five eights these yeah. days, and, and, and they're paid you know, very well for it. Um, like you said, they're you know, 19, 18, 19, 21-year-old kids mm. at the end of the day, uh, being paid big money on the biggest stage and expected... You know, to perform, you know, like I said, and, and run, their, run their clubs and win games. And, um, you know, sometimes I worry that, you know, the way the media works in some ways is that we, you know, we pump them up when they're going so well, but we pump them up to a level that's unattainable, uh, yep. unsustainable, unachievable, long-term. Agreed. And eventually you're going to have to be brought down. And that's, you know, that's the challenge of professional just sports in general these days with, like I said, you know, the media outlets and whatnot is that, You've got to have, build a lot of resilience and have some good people around you to make sure that you can keep your feet, you know, level on the floor. That make sure that you know. You, uh, someone told me a good quote around that sports thing. I thought it was always nice to remember is that you're never going as well as they say you are, and, and you're never going as poorly either. And I think that's a good way to put it because yeah. when they're t t telling you you're a superstar and you can't be stopped, you're probably not. And yeah. then, but at the same time, when they're telling you should be dropped and, and kicked out and X, Y, and Z, then you're probably not at that level either. So it kind of just keeps you in that middle range somewhere, but. Again, it's great for the fans. I see it in a different light. When I watch, I'm a big fan of NFL and yep. I follow that and I'm sure the NFL players hate all the content that's put on those you know, websites and different things where I'm you know, refreshing my phone every 10 minutes trying to see a new article about NFL. So yeah. I see it from a fan's perspective, but I mean, the players just got to be you know, really smart with how they handle it and how they understand those things these days. Let's go back to 2006, a wonderful year. Grand final, a grand final win. What stands out from GF Day? Is there one moment that's more special than the others? Brisbane teetering on the threshold of reversing that trend. Play by seven to Seaver, running from Dummy Hart Berrigan, then it's with Lockyer, now it's with Parker, now it's away for Casey Maguire. Loads it down the back. It's out for Lockyer. Lockyer away for Carroll. Carroll in for Tate. Here's a try. Tate goes in. Did the corner post go? I don't think so. Um, I was probably just the week leading up, to be honest, mm. uh, especially that 2006 one. I was so you know young and 
just riding the tails of you know Lockyer and Webkey and all those great players that we had. Um, so just being there for that whole week, having all the Broncos fans come watch us train in Brisbane. I think that was, Red Hill was basically full. You could barely get out on the field. Wow. Um, and then we went down to Sydney early and you know, buses and we're down there for three or four days spending time with each other and training down there and um, all the fans that start to come out early and mm. they're staying in the similar hotels and around. You walk around Bondi Beach or Coogee, wherever we're staying and you know, there's fans again, you know, talking to you. So the whole week, grand final breakfast, all those type of things. It's just the whole build-up of the week is amazing and obviously, you know, to get there on the end and win it in that final um, day is obviously what you, you know, do it for and, and then to come back after that to Brisbane, do a little, you know, um, celebration with the fans. Again, at the, at the stadium, they had a... Um, little what do you call it platform there we were all on the on the platform singing the song and had the trophy and there's you know probably a couple of thousand fans at the training facility yeah. and all those experiences the whole week winning it and then the, then coming home to the fans and celebrating queen street mall we we're on a couple of cars going yeah. through the mall convertibles waving to the fans through the mall it's just that experience as i was 19 i was like how good is this if, yeah. like, i thought this must happen every year you know and you realize pretty quickly that's that's not the case you'd win a second premiership at a second club the dragons in 2010 Different or similar in terms of personal satisfaction and enjoyment? Yeah, well, it was very different. I think I appreciated it a lot more and, yeah. and enjoyed it. I thought you know, I missed out for a couple of years in between 06 and 10 and realised that it doesn't happen every year. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, I got to play fullback as well at the Dragons, so I felt like I you know, um, contributed more to the team mm -hmm. being there and actually winning on the day as well. Um, so I felt more a part of it. But in saying that, you know, Brisbane being my home, I've always you know, loved being there and to be able to say, you know, go down the history of being a part of that grand final and now to, you know, never win another one for Brisbane um, and I haven't won one since. It's, you know, to be a part of that um, always hold, hold something, you know, dear to my heart. But any time you play team sport, the you know, ultimate goal is to win the grand final. Mm. So those two always, you know, hold you know, some of the best memories in rugby league. We are out of order a little bit, but talking about the Dragons, the move from uh, Brisbane to St George Illawarra, a huge move for a, a young kid and a young introverted kid. How do you look back on that now? Yeah, I'm grateful that I did take that opportunity. It was something that was forced on me a little bit. Um, the Broncos kind of just said, look, get a contract for 2009. This was in 2008. Yep. Uh, I just played Origin at the time as well. Uh, they said, we won't re-sign re you after that, so you might as well go now. Well, you're playing good footy, you're injury-free. Um, so I was quite shocked, and I know that's when I suppose I realised it is a business at the end of the day. That, you, know, you don't just get to choose where you want to play. Some some players are lucky enough to do that, and others get moved on. Mm. So Wayne just said, "Well, you know, come with me." It was later in the season. There wasn't really, I think, them and the Bulldogs were money opportunities. I think Sunny Bill just went overseas and left the Bulldogs at that time. So they were kind of my two options, and mm. obviously chose Wayne. And um, but looking back, I'm so glad I did it you know, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, out of my comfort zone, playing a different club, experiencing. That getting the chance to play fullback, you know, yep. Carmichael's in Brisbane, um, so there's a lot of positives, um, and yeah, really grateful that, that happened in the end. Was 2010 your best year, perhaps, in football terms? Premiership accolades, form, Clive Churchill medal. Could that be the year that you look back on most fondly? Yeah, I think 2010, 2016. I was really happy with as yes. well in Brisbane. Um, back in Brisbane, did my Achilles the year before. Uh, obviously, like I said, the Broncos has been. My favourite team growing up since I was mm. probably six or seven years old. Um, played some pretty good footy through the year. Uh, finally got to play fullback for Queensland and Australia that year as well. We went on a tour that year. We were just won, won the Origin Series, won all the Australian games as well. So those two are probably my you know, standout years. Um, mm. But yeah, really enjoyed my time at the Dragons. A great bunch of blokes. Um, you know, Wollongong's a great place. Lived down there yep. along the beach. Night along the beach. Got to you know, we played a lot of Friday night games. So I flew home to the Gold Coast and Brisbane a lot. See my grandma and friends and different things. So yeah, those two are probably my two favourite years. This is the part of the interview we might get a laugh out of you. You obviously moved to the Dragons, then the Knights, uh, which we'll speak about shortly to play under Wayne Bennett. Yeah. Before we talk about your relationship with Wayne, what's the best Wayne Darius father son joke? or line or sledge you've heard there has been some amusing ones over the years yeah um there's, there's a funny sledge actually which um i've told a few of the boys this they always laugh is that when i even played new zealand in early days in, in brisbane it must have been 2006 or 7 so one of my first years and uh, i was pretty nervous or you could say scared to play the warriors and yeah I don't know if I was marking Manu Vatavai, but Oof. um yeah obviously you know big polynesian boys they always run hard and 
uh, I was early in my career and yeah, probably a bit tentative is a nice way to put it, I guess. And <laughs> Wayne would always give a stat sheet um, at the end of on Mondays when you come back to training. Uh, everyone would get to see it. Everyone would get one and have everyone's name, all your stats and a little comment from the coach. Uh, and my comment was, um, I think I had five runs and two tackles. So I had seven efforts for the game. And he just said, do not deserve a shower with the boys. <laughs> and I never forgot it because I was just like, you know, I'm Darren Lockie's reading that, Shane Webke's reading that, Petro, yeah. you know, Brad Thorne, all these greats and experienced players. And this little young kid winger just was a bit scared and didn't do much. Can't remember if we won or lost, but didn't deserve a shower with the boys. Um, it's something I've never forgotten. How do you describe your relationship with Wayne as we sit here in 2021? Well, it's definitely evolved over the years. You know, Wayne was definitely a mentor and was trying to really help me out in those early years. Yep. And probably didn't say boo and just nodded and said yes and um, gave him one-word answers, um, as I did to a lot of people. But, um, yeah, I've, you know, like I said, I've grown in myself personally. I've learned a lot, and now I feel like we have you know, more of a two-way conversation, yep. asking each other about our families and what's going on and how we're doing. And, um, you know, we don't – obviously, I don't play under him anymore. Obviously, retired, but uh, when even when he left Brisbane, mm. I wondered how uh, what would our relationship go to then. And – yeah, he picks up the phone a fair bit, and I do the same. And um, and whether we talk about footy or ask, you know, how South's going, or what's he excited about, or you know, Origin series, or you more more so just talk about our families and what's going on with the kids and mm. uh, how he's doing. How big a help has he been? Yeah, he's been huge. He's um, someone I like. I said probably didn't use enough. He was always there and willing yep. to lend a hand and yeah. give me great advice. Whether it was you know buying my first house or you know. Have I checked in on my mum recently? Uh, how's my grandmother doing? You know, all those things that he just cares about you as an individual and not actually anything to do with rugby league. Um, but then obviously on the on the field, you know, I followed Wayne for two reasons. Was you know, obviously I wanted to be a um, better rugby league player, and I thought he was the best coach to do that, and he wanted me to be there, which is you know always wanted to you know, want to feel wanted and trusted and yes appreciated in life and any workforce. But I always also thought I could be a better person under him, and that's something that. Um, I said I probably should have used him up more. He could have uh, made me a better person earlier than what I had to find out the hard way, I guess. But um, yeah, a lot of fond memories of Wayne. Whether it was picking me in that 06 grand final and he could have picked other people, yeah. um, taking me to the Dragons, you know, I was lucky enough to win another comp with him. Uh, even going to Newcastle, I had some tough years there mentally and um, personally, but I learned so, a lot, so much about myself and I got the help that I needed. So I have a lot of um, gratitude for that experience as well. And uh, he brought me back to Brisbane where it's home. Yep. Uh, where I could finish my career, maybe captain, you know. So there's so many things he's you know, done for me on and off the field that I really can't repay. We hope you're enjoying Andy Raymond Unfiltered, podcasts like you've never heard before. Why? Because they're unfiltered. Make sure you're following us on social media, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at The Andy Raymond. Then you won't miss a thing. And before you go, we'd really love a five-star rating and review on whatever app you're currently listening on. It helps us grow as we continue to expand the unfiltered brand. Make sure you come back soon, legends. This episode is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors at Griffin Air Conditioning. Griffin Air Conditioning offers the highest quality of air conditioning sales and service across the Sydney metropolitan area, providing installation and maintenance to commercial, domestic and industrial customers. Working with this team, you'll be guaranteed the latest services, technology and developments in the industry, as well as dealing with some legendary blokes. Visit griffinair.com.au and tell them we sent you for a cool deal. That's griffinair.com.au. Welcome back to Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Darius Boyd story. Part one was about the early years, the challenges and the beginning of the transformation. The story continues. Newcastle, good times, tough times, all rolled into one. The expectation for the club at that time 
was extreme, immense pressure on from game one. Looking back, it was actually ridiculous pressure. Mm. You know, Tinkler, Bennett, Boyd, here comes Smith and Scott mm. and... He, the Knights are ready to win a premiership yeah. in year one. Yeah, I think we were favourites or second favourites yeah. once without him playing a game and then a ball being kicked. Um, but yeah, it was a challenge. I think that's probably where I learnt that, you know, I suppose I hadn't had a lot of... I've always had success and yeah. been pretty successful. I don't think I'd missed the finals in any year we'd, I'd played in my career up until that point. And I probably just thought it just you would know, hit the ground running. I probably hadn't understood that, you know, uh, obviously you have to work hard, which mm. we did, but... Um, there's different things we had to work on as a group and Newcastle we had some young players in the team and probably didn't have a lot of depth in that first year we kind of the players we had were the players we had so you couldn't be chopping and changing and you just had yep. to uh, make do and I think that's you know why Wayne probably brought in some more experience in year two and we went pretty well in year two but yeah year one was a massive reality check for me is I had you know my life around the wrong way I had rugby league as number one mm. and family friends and everything else number two um, so when rugby league wasn't going the way I'd hoped and planned and, mm. and successful myself personally or the team, then my whole world seemed to come crashing down. And that's, again, I look on it back now, a positive experience to learn a lot about myself and obviously change a few things in my life. But uh, at the time, it was you know, you know, very challenging. We spoke earlier about the highlights in 2010. The pain of 2014 outweighed that, sadly. Early in the year, a game we were both at, your close mate Alex McKinnon was severely injured. What do you recall of that night? Yeah, I was actually injured that first couple of. Um, I had done my hamstring round one, so mm. I was. Um, that was round four. I'm pretty sure it was. Um, so I was actually watching it at home. Oh, were you? Yeah, so I wasn't there. So uh, it was quite. Yeah, you know, obviously seeing you. you know, me and Alex lived together. Yep. Uh, Alex lived with myself and my wife Kayla for a year as well. Uh, a year after, so we lived together at the Dragons for two years. Um, and then when we moved to Newcastle, he moved into his place and uh, me and Kayla got our own place as well. We were very close. Uh, our, you know, wives and girl, well, girlfriends mm. at the time were very close. Um, to see it happen, you, you, know, you never think the worst. You don't yep. really know what happened. You know, it's just people go off in a neck brace a lot and it's a concussion, it's you know, precautionary. Um, but it was a weird you know, feeling and I remember you know, texting Alex <laughs> that night. Obviously, that wasn't going to get anywhere or do anything, yep. but you kind of just don't know what to do in that situation. And it wasn't until, you know, Days later, weeks later, mm-hmm. you start to under, uh, understand what could possibly happen. I think we spoke to Wayne and he was kind of you know, filling us in on what was happening and mm-hmm. how he was doing. And it was just a, yeah, an experience that um, you never wish upon anyone. It was something that, um, when you think back now, it's still something that I can't really still believe actually happened. I look back on it for differing reasons. Uh, it was a Monday night. Uh, I was sidelined with Fox Sports. I was in the tunnel when Alex came off mm-hmm. and there was something very different about watching an injured player come off. Mm. Uh, and, and I feared the worst. I could hear the medics and the doctors and, and training staff and, and what they were saying. Yet on the other hand, I've got the director and producer in my ear saying, we need to know what's happening with Alex. And so yeah. in a split second, I've got to make a decision. And I said three or four times throughout the night, we don't know exactly what's wrong with Alex um, because the worst thing I could have done is the uh, the reporter on air is say shit this is what I've just heard he's got mm. no feeling um, because that alarms people and and families mm. and, yeah. and loved ones you dealt with differing forms of depression and, and, and mental desperation was this the start of a, a tipping point for you, seeing a mate go down like that? Because in an instance like this, Darius Boyd is helpless. Mm. You can't control the situation. And often something like that is the trigger of an emotional spiral. Yeah, I think anything when you t- talk to people about mental health and well-being, you know, a lot of people are you know one serious hardship away from a mental breakdown. Yep. And I think for me personally, I probably had... I felt like I had 10 things, you know, I was seeing a psychologist at the time. I had probably 10 things to talk about in an hourly visit, probably every yep. three or four weeks when I could fit it into my rugby league schedule. And it just wasn't enough. And I think, you know, Alex, you know, injury was another, you know, tipping part of that. Mm. Um, and I remember um, you know, going to see Alex when he was able to have visitors probably weeks, even if not a month or so later. Yep. And um, he had a you know, positive outlook. He had a smile. And that actually rattled me too because I felt like, you know, for me, uh, going, I was going through different things with my grandmother and the, and the footy club and you know, successes and injuries and 
um, mm. you know, my personality and who I was as a person and all these things I felt like I was struggling with yet. Alex is in, you know, in bed. Um, some had you know, tubes in and around his mouth yep. um, but with a smile, a positive outlook, um, doing his best uh, for a guy to be going through that. Yet you know, I felt like I had all these little, when you in, put him in the comparison to what he's going through, yep. all these little things on the side. And what am, you know, what am I, why, why can't I be happy? What am, mm. What's wrong with me, you know? So, yeah, it was, I think it's, it was really tough seeing you know, a mate going through something like that. Um, but on the flip side, you know, um, one thing that's great about the rugby league community is that and they get around behind people and they really support yeah. each other. And, you know, that's why you play the game when you're six or seven years old because you want to make some good friendships. Um, you know, you want to have a bit of fun. Um, and I think the teamwork, all those type of things. And I think, you know, seeing the rugby league community get behind Alex, I think the rise of Alex round the, the week after um, was great. Um, and then getting all the you know, fundraising, all the things that Newcastle didn't get behind yeah. him and, and the NRL as, as a whole as well, I think, you know, speaks volumes for, for the rugby league community and there's some really good people um, in and amongst it as well. A few months later, you manned up, not always easy for us blokes. So you go off and gets in the way because we know everything. That's how we were born. You manned up, you put your hand up, you said, I need some help. I can't continue living like this. I can't do it by myself either. That decision alone, you can now look back on that decision as a game changer. Is mm. that right? Yeah, it was the best decision I ever made in my life. Mm. Um, you know, people ask you, what's your greatest achievement? And it's probably putting my hand up and you know, going to a mental health facility in a way because, yeah, I played for Australia, won grand finals. I've done those things in rugby league, but, you know, it didn't mean as much as it should have meant yep. um, and a lot of people you know even these days you think about life you think um, what's happiness or that you know that job promotion or that extra bit of money or whatever it is and and you realize if you get there that um, you're still the same person you still have yeah. the same thoughts and beliefs and your child hasn't changed there's a lot of things that doesn't change with money and and you know job uh, yep. focus so uh, for me it was something that I needed to change I wasn't this happy you know, mm. kid anymore I wasn't enjoying life i didn't i had you know a strange outlook on different things um i just needed to change i didn't know what i needed to do i didn't know what was wrong with me but i just needed some help i needed some guidance and i was willing and prepared to do anything to to get it and i think that was the biggest key is um you've got to want the help and you've got to willing to you know put it into practice and and, and make change mm. uh, and that's what i was willing to do i pushed my wife away my friends you know, rugby league wasn't enjoyable anymore um, and I didn't know where to turn and what to do next. And uh, when I look back now, I wish I did it five years sooner, but uh, I'm so glad I did it when I did it and not when I've you know, retired from rugby league or finished my career um, so I could make some changes and also just be in such a you know, better space for when you know, retirement came. You're listening to Andy Raymond Unfiltered, the Legends series. We have corporate and private sponsorship packages available. You set the terms. For further information on how you can become part of the team, go to the website andyraymondunfiltered.com.au and hit the sponsorship tab. Brave move, mate, because you were probably the first or one of the first professional athletes to, to put their hand up. Nowadays, it happens publicly more often, mm. but there was really no one before you. so. Being one of the first, it was a daunting prospect as well. Yeah, I think I think there was probably people before me. I don't know if there was anyone that was went public. I yeah. think that was the thing. And you know, I remember speaking to Wayne, um, just you know, basically ringing him, saying I needed help and uh, what I wanted to do. And he kind of asked me if I wanted to, you know, what do I want to do with the media? Because obviously, it was going to be a big issue. I was a three week. I was going through three weeks uh, into the clinic, and I can't, you know, um, excuse my absence for three weeks. Yeah. So. He's like, what do you want to say? What do you want to do? You know, talk about an injury or something. I was like, oh, I'm, you know, and I just said, I'm sick of hiding. I'm sick of uh, hiding my life away, sick of not being open and honest. So I just want to, that's the way I want to move forward is just, you know, and wow. whatever will be, will be. And yeah, I remember sitting in the clinic first couple of nights and there's, you know, um, watching the news and there's clips of me on there and talking about mental health facility and rehab and uh, other inpatients there watching the news and they're looking at me and seeing that on TV. It was just, yeah, it was, it was strange, but. Um, you know, social media wasn't as big back then as well, so yeah. probably, and I didn't never had social media, so I probably got off lightly in that in that respect. Mm. If it was you know to happen today, it'd be probably a different story. Um, but yeah, again, that was all part of the journey: being open, honest, putting my hand up, 
being open to whatever help I needed, yeah. uh, whether that was uh, medication or just you know group therapy, whatever I needed, I didn't really mind because I just knew I wanted to. I didn't want to live the life I was living anymore. Was it confronting? It was. It was parts of it was you know very confronting. I remember driving up to the facility and it um, it looked like it needed a bit of a renovation yeah. and up up <laughs> upkeep. So um, it looked like an old school building. Uh, it was in Wentworthville, uh, Ramsey Healthcare uh, facility. It was, but. Um, yeah, I had a nurse that I still keep in contact with this day, till this day. Um, she just basically welcomed me in with open arms and basically treated me like a son. And like I said, we still keep in contact and I still bounce ideas off her and um, we still catch up regularly, which is great. And um, But after a couple of days in there, I realized, you know, it was the best place for me. I could just, you know, focus on me yep. and also understand that uh, this is normal. There's so many other people in there, especially when you go through those group sessions that... Um, it's not uncommon to go through a tough time or we'll be struggling and it's also you find a bit of gratitude and empathy pretty quickly when you realize that you hear some other people sharing their stories and yeah. for me it was about my grandmother and, and football and my childhood and um, you know, success and perfectionism and my mate and you know, mm. my wife and all these different things and some people have had some really really big hardships I won't say but some things that are you yeah. know, a lot more challenging than what I was going through and it instantly gave me a, you know that reflection of well hang on am I really in here just for these things you know and, and everyone's situation and, and adversity is different mm. but they're all individual and important to, to yourself and you've got to make peace with yourself and you look yourself in the mirror every day and have a smile and be happy and that was something that I needed to fix but it was something that I've you know after a couple of days I'd really I felt a lot better about myself. Did you leave rehab a different bloke or did you leave rehab just a better version of the same bloke? Yeah, I think just a better version. Yeah. I think um, I just had to change my outlook on a few things. I needed to practice, you know, like I said, a couple of those tips and, and strategies and tools around you know, building resilience. Um, you know, I needed to grow my support network was one. Yep. Um, I didn't have, like I said, with my child, I didn't have a lot. I didn't open up to a lot of people. Um, you know, probably could have used Wayne a lot more and I've probably used him a lot more since I've left the clinic. Um, you know, practicing gratitude is another big one, something that yeah. in anything, any you know, aspect of life, you know, there's always something to be grateful for. Um, you might have to look a little harder sometimes, yeah. but um, you know, empathy, doing something for somebody else, you know, giving back was another one that I wanted to you know, take from the clinic and use. Having a plan as well. Like I was estranged from my mum for eight years. Uh, from you know, She was diagnosed with major depression when I was 15 and like I said, I moved in with my grandmother and we kind of lost contact when I turned 18. Yep. Um, and I had a, you know, a negative outlook on uh, that experience. So I yep. needed to make contact with her and make peace with that. Um, so, it was, yeah, a bit of a plan to you know, reconnect with my you know, wife and, and make that a priority, make her number one and family number one and rugby league number two. It yeah. And it didn't mean that I wasn't going to play as hard or give it my all. It just yep. mean, meant that when I had a, a loss or an injury or some hardship through rugby league that I was a, still a good person. I still mm. was a valued member of my community and yep. all these different things. So, yeah, I just learned a lot about myself and the ways to, you know, get around different challenges. Um, and I needed to work on that. It wasn't – I didn't leave after three weeks and instantly become fixed. Yep. These things I had to work out and I still work out. I still practice gratitude and I try to get out in the community and you know, give back and help mm. others. And I always lean on my support network. I exercise. You know, all these things are the core pillars of mental health and these are things that, um, you just get better and better over time and you can be the best version of yourself. Most important question of the, the interview is we sit here in 2021, how is your mental health space? Yeah, it's really good. I think uh, I've been asked a lot, you know, how's retirement, how are you finding it, yep. uh, what are you up to? And I've, I say every time I say, well, I've never retired before, but I, I feel great. Yeah. Um, you know, my wife was worried and I, I spoke to my psychologist and just said, look, am I meant to... How am I meant to feel? Like if I'm feeling good, is that she thinks I'm lying to myself? Yeah. Like I'm I'm making it up. And he goes, you can't you know make up feelings. If you feel that way, it's the way you feel. You've yeah. probably you know you've been working towards this for four or five years. Mm. Um, like you said, you you know, practice those things around gratitude. You have a great support network. You you have passion about you know, the mental health space and the work you're doing now. Like all these things that you're enjoying, it's it's probably just your time. And you're and you're ready. And um, so yeah, I mean. Uh, I miss you, you. You miss the big games. You miss the mate. Sh the mateship. You know, magic round was just you know on. So you miss those things. You miss Origin. You know, yeah. But at the same time, lucky enough to work around it or be involved in it. Uh, I still work at the Broncos, so I see a lot of the boys and keep in contact with a lot of them. So the only thing that's really changed in my life is um, putting the boots on on Friday or Saturday night. 
and not feeling sore on a Monday. That's really <laughs> the only change. So I'm very lucky that I do get to work at the club and yeah. still keep that. My transition has been great and it's you know flowed into different work for the club. Mm. So my, my environment, my situation hasn't changed a lot. And like I said, I've been you know, working towards this for a few years. So I think I've made that transition really well, really easy. Back to footy, three years at the Dragons, three years at the Knights. What's the difference representing Queensland then returning to New South Wales as a resident the morning after, very different as opposed to returning to the Red Hill Broncos dressing room after mm. Origin, I'd imagine. Yeah, it's a different feeling. I think, um, I suppose you've one hand, Queensland dressing sheds, turning back to up the Red Hill or Broncos, you, you know, everyone's proud of you, everyone's you know, cheering for you yeah. and, um, you know, and, and all the fans are in the streets and they're still wearing their Origin jerseys for you know, weeks after. Um, in New South Wales, you have a, I don't know a little bit of just like a just a little you know smirk on your face, a little yeah. bit of you're walking a bit taller, walking on your toes, just like you know that everyone watched it, everyone was going hating and wishing you weren't going to score or yep. do well, and um, not I wouldn't say cockiness or arrogance, but a little bit of you know just um, you know be pleased and um, you know and most of the time we had uh, the Dragons, especially being a couple of New Newcastle had a couple of you know New South Wales players in both teams, so. You always talk about the game and everyone be giving each other a bit of stick and yeah, yeah it was either it was, it was enjoyable in different ways and and we didn't win every game either we won most of the series but mm. we didn't always win every game so they got their little fair share of you know enjoyment and excitement and, but majority was um, yeah for us. And Dallas Johnson has been poleaxed a couple of times in his most recent Origin matches. As I said earlier, you're wearing the headgear tonight. Quickly across the line, Harrison on. Inglis with the fin, the big fin from Inglis, steps over the 40, over the 30, draws the last line, and Darius Boyd will go all the way. Queensland get the first try of the night. On to boo, Darius Boyd. Jonathan Thurston operating on the left-hand side, Prince to the right, and it was just a great fin from Inglis to get rid of firstly Mark Yasnia. And then the position he had, Jonathan Thurston on his inside, Boyd on the outside, and the ideal start for the home team. That origin side, or era, is probably a better way to put it. Unbelievable, and it will be looked back for as long as the game has played as quite possibly the best side ever. Is it something you think about, something you're unaware of, or something you're proud of? Oh yeah, definitely proud of. I think um, it's something I've probably, now that I've retired, you probably reflect a lot more yeah. uh, and think about... Yeah, how lucky we were to be in those, or well, myself personally, but as a, just a group and to be mostly injury free and, and keep mm. the core group of that team together. Um, a lot of guys played a lot of numbers of, of games just because, you know, pick and stick and we were successful and, mm. um, you know, really got a lot of, uh, a really great bond um, in those, you know, six weeks you'd spend each each year and, and some of the, my better mates in, in football are from those teams yep. purely because I think, you know, with success and, it uh, comes, you know, I suppose that teamwork and that culture and that mm. really good environment. A lot of you know players had kids over those years, and the mm. kids have grown up, and the wives have become friendly, and um, you know it's just a, it was just a really good, you know good experience. And Mel Mel created that with you know the culture and what he dr drove, um, and then Kevy took it on for those last couple of years that I was involved as well. And you know, we have ex players around. It's just a yeah the way the media builds it up, the way it's you know. Loved and hated between different mm. fans and rivalry. Just the whole build-up, the whole excitement, the whole you know, six weeks of it. Um, it was, it's hard to say there's a much better place to be in rugby league. As a footballer, where were you best? Wing, fullback, centre, five-eight. I definitely wouldn't say five-eight, uh, but yeah, yeah, I think fullback. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was lucky enough to learn off a couple of great ones. Obviously, Carmichael early in my years in, in yep. Brisbane and. Um, and then Billy through you know, Origin and rep, rep jumpers, rep teams. Mm. Um, and as you get older, you get you know, smarter and the game changes. And um, I like to think, yeah, I contributed a fair amount of my best games at, at fullback. Um, and saying that, I was always proud of being versatile because, you know, if I wasn't able to play different positions, I probably would have never had a rep career. Yeah. Um, you know, Carmichael was playing a bit of fullback. Then Billy really took that um, jersey for probably 10 years. Mm. Um, I took over for... I, 12 months while he was injured and he went all right didn't he Slater. yeah he's pretty good yeah. <laughs> um so yeah i mean I'm, i was always proud of myself being able to play different positions i started on the wing and you know, played a lot of center and eventually moved to fullback and then later in my career went back to center a bit of mm. five eight and and wing and rep most rep games so yeah i was always proud of my um, versatility and obviously uh, also my longevity too i felt like i you know i played a lot of games mm. uh, in my career and 
Um, I was very proud of that as well. You're a Queensland boy. You're a Brisbane fan as a kid. Playing against Brisbane in Brisbane, weird feeling? Yeah, it's always weird to play against your old teams, even when I played against the Dragons and, and Newcastle, especially when the same players are playing. Yeah. Not so much over the years when they, you know, the teams change, you don't know the players like mm. you did before. But, but I loved it. I, I mean, when I was away, I loved coming back to the Suncorp. There's no better place to play, in my yep. opinion. And it's not really a away game uh, for most teams coming to Suncorp. Uh, that's probably why Magic Round goes so well, because you know, everyone loves yeah. playing there. and. Uh, it's a great place to play. Um, you don't really hear the, the boos of the fans. I don't feel like the Brisbane fans boo the other team as much as you do in some of those suburban yeah. Sydney grounds. Um, but yeah, it's just a great place to play. I really enjoyed it. Obviously, family and friends would always come and watch as well. Yep. I'd be able to spend the weekend here. Um, so I always really loved coming back to Suncorp when I was away. The decision to come back to the Broncos and finish up, right move on so many levels. It was a real full circle for you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was something I was very grateful for, and I can have Wayne to thank for that. Yeah, um, I just had a you know three month, three month, six month break from football yep. um, through my mental health journey, and um, you know, anyone else probably would have looked at that situation maybe you know, steered clear. But you know, Wayne was you know, happy to have me back in Brisbane he if you. I wanted to come back, and um, I couldn't have thought of a better place to come back and and start my. Mm. I suppose my journey and growth of becoming you know, the best version of myself mm. back in Brisbane and where it all started. And I always thought I've had you know, the chance to go back to Queensland. I'd probably have to go to the Titans, um, which again, the Gold Coast is where I'm from, but you know, Brisbane was always my favourite team and my, yep. and my spot. And I started there. And to be able to come to finish there, uh, eventually you know, you know, be the captain for a couple of years and then retire in Brisbane, um, yeah, something that I always you know, be grateful for and I owe a lot to Wayne for that. Griffin Air Conditioning offers the highest quality of air conditioning sales and service across the Sydney metropolitan area, providing installation and maintenance to commercial, domestic and industrial customers. Working with this team, you'll be guaranteed the latest services, technology and developments in the industry. Visit griffinair.com.au and tell them we sent you for a cool deal. You mentioned the captaincy. You were only the ninth Broncos captain. What does that mean to you? Well, I cried in the press conference. Yeah. So it probably says a fair bit. Um, again, that, just the whole journey. You can ask anyone, yourself included. You know, when I started my career in my early years, you'd say, "Oh, that guy will be the captain of the Broncos one day." You'd, mm. Everyone would laugh and um, put a thousand dollars on it. It wouldn't happen. So, you know, for me, the, the full circle, I was you know, able to achieve not just in my playing career but yeah. as a person um to captain the club that i wanted to play one game for um i think you know again something that still doesn't really feel real and it's a bit surreal but um i really enjoyed the role and enjoyed um trying to lead a group of you know young men which we had a lot of young guys in the back end of my career there but um it's something i've really enjoyed and something i've always you know be very proud of the role of leader does that sit well with you because a, a captain is also a leader off the field yeah I think early on I struggled with it I think yep. and we had a lot of good players when I, my first year with Benji Marshall Adam Blair you know um, Josh McGuire Matt Gillette um, probably leaving a few out Ben Hunt we had a heap of um, Sam Thide had a heap of leaders in the team yep. so I've probably felt uh, a bit uncomfortable a little bit and yeah. I just wanted to lead by action and play good footy and that's what kind of Wayne said to me as well and uh, and I wanted to give those guys, let them do what they wanted to do. If they wanted mm. to say something, they wanted to do their thing. I was more than happy to because you know, I've never been someone to be the centre of attention. I've uh, cancelled surprise birthdays and different things. My wife will tell you a few times I've done that. So uh, I don't like standing up in front of the group and making things about me. But yep. at the same time, I'm passionate about rugby league and I know I think I have a good football brain and understand what works. Mm. And if things need to be said, then I'm more than happy to say it and speak up. So, But as the years got on and the team... You know, become younger and um, you know, I probably needed to mentor and lead guys, then I was really comfortable and happy to do that too. I really think I grew into the role and I, and I enjoyed um, helping and leading some of those young mm. ones like you know, like Carmichael and Lockie and those guys did for me when I was yep. starting. That's the full circle you, you do. As a player, when you get older, you help those young ones coming through mm. and eventually they take your spot and you see them grow into you know, hopefully big long careers for themselves. And you know, I really enjoyed that in the back end of my career. You mentioned the word press conference. We probably can't finish without reflecting on that press conference. Yeah. The infamous one at the Dragons. One sentence answers, bloody short sentences too. Yeah. In hindsight, how do you look back on that? 
yeah, I, I'm not proud of it, but at the same time, it's all part of my journey. Yeah, you know, so I don't, exactly I don't look right. at it. I'm not. Um, yeah, I don't look at it in a bad light. You know, just one of those things. I've I've done um, some different speaking engagements the last six months, and I've played that to. Uh, some school kids and they all had a laugh and actually clapped. So I was like, "What are you? I don't know what you're clapping about. It's, it's not a <laughs> something to be proud of yeah. or something to uh, envy or um, look at." But um, yeah, I mean, a bit of context around that was the way I used to look at football: just be all end all. Yep. Um, R- rugby league was number one. We played Canberra the week before. Um, we lost the game. I, I missed the tackle. They scored. We lost. It was at mm. the Dragons. Um, so I, all week, you know, I was kicking stones. I let the team down. It was my fault, you know. Blame yourself. How, blame myself. How mm. could I do that to the team? Punish myself. Don't leave the house. You know, kicking stones at training again mm. the next week. Uh, the media manager said, oh, it's your turn to do media. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing media. And yeah. I didn't like media as it was at the time. And, mm. and she's like, well, that's part of your obligation. It sponsors, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, no worries. And that's, I've made my mind up. That's what I was going to do. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I don't look at it. Yeah, it's it's embarrassing, but at the same time, it's you know part of my journey. It's something that I had to grow from, and um, hopefully, I can teach young ones today that that's not the way to do things. Do you wish you would have handled the media differently? Because it seemed to me, many in the media found a real voice late in your career, almost as a square up. Mm. Oh, I don't. I never look back and would change anything because like I said that's it's just a part of my journey and um I didn't know any better you know in life you could wish you do a lot of things um uh, with anything really yep. change to different you know situations environments mm. um things you do in all aspects of life so you can't you can never look back all you can do is go forward and um and they have, when I made changes in my life I wanted to be you know open honest and um do whatever it took to be the best version of myself and if that come with you know, criticism or scrutiny or a square up, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, a pretty positive outlook on life these days. And if people want to, you know, treat you differently or get a square up, you know, that's you know, I think I think about you know, good things happen to good people and karma and all that. Bingo. You know, I always try to make sure I'm doing. I have to look at myself in the mirror every day, and I don't want to you know, disrespect anyone mm-hmm. or do the wrong thing. And I probably did do that. I was probably a bit of you know, arrogant and um, confrontational, or you know challenging in in my early years but that was you know i put that down to you know a lot of my childhood and things i hadn't understood and and trust issues and different things 300 first grade games an amazing club a rare club in the most amazing set of circumstances your 300th game was playing against wayne bennett pretty cool how life works sometimes no it's crazy how it works yeah for wayne and sebes to swap you know mid uh mid pre-season and end of 2000 and um, 18 for the 2019 season and it happened to be that in round 8 it would be my 300th game and we happened to play the Rabbitohs where Wayne was um, was coaching so I'd Bizarre. played my ho- 292 under him and then I was going to play my 300th against him yeah. so yeah we, we got towed up and I didn't play well myself but um, yeah to look back and to say that he was still there albeit on a different side I think was yeah, it's pretty special Retirement right timing? Yeah I think so I mean I had another year on my contract to go, but um, yeah, I think the time was right. Um, moving around different positions uh, yep. under Sebes, and that was his um, preference and idea, and that's fine. That's he was the coach, and um, had a crack at centre, and did five eight, and then went back to fullback. So it was mm-hmm. nice to finish my career at fullback, where I've you know, it's my best position, and yeah, agreed. Um, where I enjoy it the most, and but yeah, I think so. I think I've you know it's. It's hard times at the Bronx at the moment, and um, we talk about criticism. Um, you know, the highest profile and sometimes the highest paid. Well, not sometimes, all the time. Those yep. two come together, and they they're the ones that cop most of the criticism. And um, yeah, it's a rebuilding team, and I think they need to probably just you know, stick with their young guys and really go as much as they can. And one or two years down the track, you see all these kids, our uh, kids, that played twenty, thirty games, you know, being really, really successful. Yep. You know, look at Penrith; they've you know probably didn't have the failures that the Bronx have had in the last mm. year or so, um, but they you know, have taken some time. Now they're you know, looking at un- unstoppable and they're all young, a young group. And I think you know, if Frisian can try and keep a lot of those guys together, then they can do something similar. In terms of footballing, what are you most proud of, mate? Oh, that's hard. Um, yeah, obviously the mateships that you make, the friendships, mm. um, the, th- the spaces that Rugby League you know, put me into probably... 
good and bad, but I learned a lot you know, yep. over the years, um, whether it's about you know, the media or the sponsorships or um, how you know, life has worked. You can relate a lot of you know, things you've learned in rugby league back to you know, just the normal workforce as well. Mm. Um, but it's a hard question, but a yeah, 15-year career, very grateful for everything that rugby league's given me uh, on and off the field and for different reasons, some positive, some negative, but I take them all as you know, either you know, some highlights or some learning curves. What do you change? if you could change anything in terms of footy? Oh, these are hard questions. Oh, it's probably just to do with the outside pressures and yep. things that come with rugby league. And the, but again, that's part of, part of the journey, isn't it? It is, and I suppose it's... But I worry that it's getting you know, to a point where it's, you know, something bad is going to happen before we really look at mm. the way that we do things. You know, I think... Uh, that's probably all sports. It's probably all society at the end of the day. But um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of, like you said at the start, there's a lot of pressure on athletes and particularly rugby league um, kids these days. And they are just kids. And, yeah. and I, you know, we try to put you know, good people around them and good programs in place, but you can't be with them every single day. And I just worry that you know, someone's going to do something silly before we look at change. Do you want to stay involved in the game or is it time for a footy break? Yeah, that's a good question as well. It's something that... I'm fine for both. I don't mm. want to. Um, I just want to grow myself in a couple of different areas. That you know, if rugby league's a part of my future, then I'm more than happy to be a part of it because yep. I've, I've loved it since as a little kid. I was the biggest fan growing up. Watched every game every week, and okay. um, to be involved in it still, of coaching or in you know, mentoring, you know, whatever it may be, then if that pops up, I'm you know more than happy and willing to be a part of it. But at the same time, if if it's not, and I can grow and do some other things, and I think options is key in life and that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. Are you grumpy enough to be a coach? I don't know about grumpy enough, but I'm definitely, I think I understand people, yeah. which I think is the way the game is going you know, these days. We had five coaches get sacked last year, which is yep. in 2020, well, 2020 and you know, COVID 2021. You know, it's just crazy to think whether there's enough good ones, whether it's you know clubs just balking at uh, wins and losses, whether it's man managers whether it's mm. too much you know um, content and analysis I don't really know but you know, I'm probably biased because I've been with Wayne for so long but and I, I, I imagine you know Craig Bellamy and Trent Robertson two other greats in the coaching arenas mm. that I'm pretty sure they have really good you know man manager skills and relationships with their players a lot of trust and respect mm. and honest conversations and I think you know I'm learning a lot of that in the mental health space and some of the study I'm doing I think I probably understand that and I think that's a big part of coaching. 336 first grade games, never sent off, never cited by definition, the very role model we're searching for in terms of how to play the game well and fairly. Nine Origin Series victories, two NRL premierships, a Clive Churchill medal, a World Club Championship and 23 tests for your country without a loss. But beyond all the achievements and away from the spotlight with the football boots still in a bag in the garage, you've matured into a wonderful young man who has learnt the lessons of his past. Your hands are full with a wonderful wife and three gorgeous daughters. It's been a pleasure, Darius Boyd. You, sir, are a legend. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate you having me, mate. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Andy Raymond Unfiltered. Make sure you're following us on social media, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at The Andy Raymond. Then you won't miss a thing. And before you go, we'd love a five-star rating and review on whatever app you're currently listening on. It helps us as we look to grow the unfiltered brand. Make sure you come back soon, legends.